So perhaps uh, Papert, would you like to start off? Yeah, what I feel about nine-tenths of what the other participants said is in a different universe from the things that seem uh, important to me. Uh, I, I, I find myself somewhat at a loss for the first time I remember recently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'd, li I'd like to say a few things. First of all, I'd like to put myself in the unusual position of criticizing some of the easy assumption of the achievement of artificial intelligence. And it seems to me that most of what Putnam and Mackay say is, assumes that uh, we can make some kind of simulation of, of human of, of human experience, of, of, of human behavior, and then they are concerned with how you would reconcile that situation with certain assumptions that we are used to making about our psychological, philosophical, theological relations to ourselves and the world. Uh, it seems to me, first of all, that in that state where we had these artificial intelligences, if we had them, it would be very unlikely that the old philosophical, theological, psychological relations with ourselves would survive any more than the medieval ones survived the, the development of, of modern science and the Renaissance. And, uh, however, uh, I don't really want to go into that. I'm I have, sorry, I raised it. What I'd really like to take up is the one, one, one serious practical point that Putnam raised about the immediate feasibility of artificial intelligence, and that is the question of the lack of generality in AI programs. And I'd like to, I'd like to uh, spell out a point or two that I think did not apparently come across from, from what I was saying. First of all, uh, I certainly was not saying that uh, AI is one thing after another. I mean, very much not. On the contrary, I said that's not the mode in which I'd like to discuss artificial intelligence. Uh, it's not a matter of an empirical observation that the programs this year are better than the programs last year. Uh, the nature of the enterprise, as I see it, has changed from that to something else. And the nature of the something else is an examination of kinds of human knowledge. Uh, what this means in relation to generality is something like this. If one thinks in terms of the brain power kind of model of, of intelligence, I include under that anybody who, any views reign of the form uh, some special property of the, of the brain tissue is responsible for intelligence or any view of the form that some very powerful algorithms like some super hyper resolution principle will be discovered and these will cause enormously greater possibilities of, of deduction and, and, and drawing out of consequences of, of assumptions and, and so on, including all that in one basket putting under brain power, and putting in the other basket the kind of approach that I was trying to call epistemological. Uh, what I'd like to focus on is what does the switching to epistemology mean in terms of generality? It's quite clear that everybody who believes in brain power thinks of that as his source of generality, and that's why he believes in brain power, that, that the brain power is the source of, of the great generality of, of human intelligence. Uh, you have this enormously powerful general uh, apparatus that grinds away at the particular pieces of knowledge in order to produce the, the, the particular conclusions. If we give that up, what possibility is there to find generality? And the main theme that I'd like to suggest is, as, as, as becoming more and more dominant in, in thinking about AI, is a set of answers to 
that question. Where else could the generality come from? Now I'm going to pick on one other source of generality. If the source of generality is not in general mechanisms, it is in general ideas. And the possibility of generality of, of intelligence then uh, is identical with the existence of certain very powerful ideas which in the hands of, of scientists, philosophers, theologians, whoever, or children for that matter, are able to, uh, to, to generate enormously, enormously great intellectual power. Where would we find such ideas? Well, we'd find them by examining human thinking. We'd find them, for example, by examining, say, the history of science. And we'd ask ourselves whether in the history of science we do or do not find certain principles which in the minds of, which in the hands of the, of, 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 of the scientists have led to uh, enormous breakthroughs in the, in, in, the, in, in the power of science. And so we're led into the enterprise of looking at the history of science and how the scientists have operated rather than into the nature of, 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 brain, of, of brain mechanisms or uh, super logical deductive principles. Well, what would an example be of, of such a powerful principle? You know, I think uh, I'd like to take one, and because it happens to be one that we do, s I'd like to take two actually, and there was, they happen to be getting into certain of the more recent AI programs. And, one of them I'd like to take under the name of the whole really is very often the sum of the parts. And I'd like to go back to, to Aristotle and talk about some real thinking. Uh, by the way, I, I think an important slogan is that you can't think about thinking without thinking about thinking about something. And that a lot of the the sterility of, of the psychology of thought comes from the fact that they try to think about thinking in general uh, and not focus on thinking about thinking about something specific. Well, let's take an example, a specific problem. Let's imagine Galileo uh, fighting with a hypothetical Aristotle and I'm going to blur over a lot of history, and I know Benedetti and whatnot was, was predated Galileo, but just simplifying the story, I imagine Galileo in a dialogue with Aristotle about whether the two-pound body and the one-pound body, if released, will hit the ground at the same time. So Aristotle says, well, the two-pound body moves faster and will hit the ground in half the time or whatever. Galileo says, no, they will hit the ground at the same time. Galileo's argument is, uh, I suppose, I, I, I find most people don't know this and I'm horrified, but I think that's an important thing about education rather than about artificial intelligence. Galileo's argument goes like this. He says, if you've got a two pound body, let's imagine that you sliced it by an inch, or let's imagine that you had two separate one pound bodies and you dropped those would they take the same time to reach the ground as a single one pound body? And we have to imagine that Aristotle, I think I've never heard it suggest that Aristotle would not assent to that, the, just by a sort of s obvious symmetry, the two separate one pound bodies would fall to the ground in the same time as the, as the single one pound body. Then says Galileo, since they're falling together, if you were to stretch a gossamer thread between them, wouldn't they then, so Aristotle might say, oh no, but the, uh, the gossamer thread might break because there's interactions. And Galileo would point out, uh, no, they wouldn't, wouldn't break because since they are falling at the same rate, there is no interaction. And so on. You spell out the argument. And what it really boils down to is that Arist Galileo has discovered an enormously powerful principle. The enormously powerful principle says you can think of the two-pound body as two separate one-pound bodies. You can sometimes think of the whole as the sum of the parts. Now, I think it's almost true that almost everywhere in physics, in mechanics anyway, where a problem has succumbed to analysis, it has succumbed first by, in some sense, being approximated by one of those uh, splitting of of, of, this, this, of a complex system into, in, into, into, into s 
simple systems. This is the principle of linearity, and it's not always true, of course. You often have to correct it afterwards by watching out for interactions, and sometimes you see the interactions are so bad that the correction undoes the whole thing. But it is a powerful strategy in, in, in physics that you can sometimes split the problem and think of the whole as the sum of the parts. An anti-psychology crack that's probably un unfair is that maybe one of the reasons why psychology is so unsuccessful and physics so successful is not that the subject matter is harder, but that psychologists have got into the habit of prefacing their books with these dire warnings against the principle that the, against the idea that you can take the whole as the sum of its parts. And, uh, this is, there's hardly a psych psychology textbook that doesn't warn you against that. There's hardly a physicist who doesn't encourage his students to, to do just that on every possible occasion. Well, I think that is an example of a very powerful principle. Now, can we put such very powerful principles into programs? And uh, you already saw one example of yes. In a very simple way, the example that I had this afternoon of the scene analysis where you take the two blocks and break them apart is a very simple example of a program which in its first version did not explicitly know this principle. The principle was merely embedded in it. But the development of such programs has taken the form of making this principle explicit to a greater and greater extent. Uh, now, to say just how goes into technical detail, but the, the, that wasn't my purpose here. The point is, my purpose is to point to a direction. Where would we look for, where do we look towards for a source of generality? And I'm saying that the, the, the epistemological approach to AI obliges us to look somewhere else than to general mechanisms and also tells us where to look in the form of, of such powerful principles. And now, if we looked, for example, at the, at the case quoted by Putnam of the uh, arithmetic program to prove the, well, if you take, in fact, any theorem-proving program in the classical sense, it's very clear that they are highly deficient in not having any general ideas. And you take this program and you give it four axioms of a group, but you don't even tell it that they're four axioms of a group. You don't give it any knowledge about groups in general or algebraic structures in general or mathematical principles in general. And hence, of course, they're highly particular. To hope that they would do anything is to succumb to the superhuman human fallacy since no person would be able to deduce anything under, under those conditions. And I don't see how in any sense it's intrinsic to the idea of, of theorem-proving programs that you should stack the cards against your poor program by giving it so little, so, so little uh, knowledge to go to and so little access to, 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 to these powerful principles. So uh, uh, this is not to say that it's been done very much. And the identification of such principles is, is, is programmatic and uh, but it's, 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 it's a direction. Uh, so uh, maybe I should stop there. Uh, oh, can I just end by saying, ending on the same little quote, that the same little other example that I ended on uh, this afternoon, that when we try to apply this idea to education, we do exactly the same thing. That is, in teaching children to think about physics, we try to isolate these powerful principles which exist in a qualitative form in the, in the thinking of the, of the physicist, but are never written down in the formal discourse of the physicist. And uh, generally speaking, the education in science and mathematics of children, and maybe in other areas too, errs in exactly the same way as the, the, the making of theorem-proving programs uh, of the highly formalized logical sort. Namely, you only talk to the children about the, the, the formalized mode of discourse of a symbolism that, that has no heuristic power in it and is not able to, 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 to function uh, it, it, which does not have any representation of the uh, process that might lead you to, 
to solve a problem. Uh, there's no reason why this should be so, except for a tradition of what kind of, of, of discourse is, is accepted by mathematicians and, and physicists as, as the proper thing to formalize. Uh, and in the same way as one would seek to, to, to give the computer more power by telling it about powerful ideas, uh, we would seek to, do seek to, give the child more power by giving him primary access to that sort of idea rather than the, the, the more formal differential equations and so on. You can't flunk the same intelligence test twice. Let me start by saying that one of the wonderful things about being invited to this uh, symposium here at Berkeley is it's practically the only time that two people from Cambridge ever talk to each other is <laughs> when they're both in Berkeley. Uh, my, my reaction to what Professor Pappert says, as I said in my talk, is frankly to be torn both ways. Um, let me try to, I think what he said is clarifying and helpful. Let me try to restate my difficulty. So you're left with both the difficulty and the answer, and you can <laughs> make up your own mind. The difficulty I see it is this, that the existing programs as opposed to what is programmatic are very special purpose. Either they have the defect of really building in a very restricted solution space or they have the defect of the normal form theorem proving programs that they really depend on exploiting some special mathematical fact. And in the case of the theorem proving programs, it's a fact called the Erbron theorem that says that if something can be proved at all, it can be proved in a certain normal form. And one or two rather simple theorems about propositional calculus and quantification theory, and then just using the fact that the machine you know, can do many computations per minute neither of which seems to have a great deal of generality. Now, when I made the remarks I did, um, what I had in mind was the following, that if one thought, and this is, uh, Professor Pappert is right, this is not taking account, this is thinking perhaps of an older stage of artificial intelligence, if one thought that one was going to have an insightful model of human cognitive structure by combining special purpose programs like the chess playing program, like the program for understanding this particular story, like the analogies program and so on, that the accumulation of a vast number of such programs or the concatenation in such a way, since some of them would operate on others, call up others, and so on, that the concatenation of a vast number of such programs would ever be a model for human cognitive structure, then that has to be wrong, I think. Put it this way, it may well be true that a model for us is a concatenated system of programs in some sense of program. But it can't be simply a concatenated system of highly special purpose programs, each of which has a very restricted solution space. One reason it can't be is just the incredible number of such programs that would be needed. And if that's the solution to the problem, the one sure thing is we'll never get it. Um, but secondly, I think there are very strong evolutionary arguments against that. I mentioned them before, but the thrust of the argument is this. I want to repeat that human be if you take an animal like a turtle or a seal or a shark or a dolphin, 
you always explain the most outstanding features of that animal as adaptations to specific problems that it faced when it was evolving. You say the turtle has this shell because it had many enemies. They like to eat turtles, even uncooked. And the shell is like a fortress, and it protects the turtle from its enemies. Only in the case of man is the capacity that was completely evolved already 30,000 years ago, a capacity to solve a vast number of problems, the great majority of which were not present in the environment when the capacity was evolved. The problem of solving differential equations was not present in the environment. The problem of writing music criticism was not present in the environment, and so forth. So you're dealing with so that the hypothesis that what we were, are, this may be uh, beating a dead horse, or, but I want to, but nevertheless, I think the point is worth nailing home. The hypothesis that the solution is that the solutions to a lot of individual problems are individually built in is no solution at all. And this is an argument both against that version of AI and against Chomsky's innateness hypothesis. If you're going to take each problem and say, well, this couldn't be learned because it's too hard, therefore the solution was innate, you're going to be in deep trouble. Now, I agree with Seymour with respect to what the direction of motion should then be. That the direction of motion should be towards general rules for solving problems, they're called powerful ideas, in particular methodological ideas towards epistemology, scientific methodology, and so on. That seems to me exactly right. I have no quarrel with that. I would only say welcome to the club. Uh, <laughs> You know, people from Bacon on have been trying to do that. I think some progress has been made. Mother, it's good to go back and read Bacon. He was no dope, and he said a lot of interesting things, like, for example, that this methodology is itself an empirical science, that to do it right, it should be done collectively, and so on, none of which are ever mentioned in the caricature of Bacon that is usually presented. So I agree that the turn should be towards epistemology. I certainly am not arguing that in principle we cannot find um, general rules of human functioning. The other, and I do want to emphasize that even if we find such rules, we will not follow that our organization is digital. In fact, one fact that really, if you think about it, one of Professor Papert's examples the example of the computation of where you should catch the baseball, that, 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 that's essentially an analog computer. And the reason that, a, that that reduces the computational complexity of that problem is that a digital computer can perfectly well simulate any analog computer you can describe. In particular, even if our brains were in some sense analog rather than digital computers. If you had a description of the rules the brain follows, then a lot, you know, had we but whirled enough in time at ignoring problems of real-time feasibility, you would undoubtedly be able to simulate that in a digital computer. So once again, the question of what is the most insightful description of our cognitive structure and how do we simulate that on a digital device have to be kept apart, I think. I have one other remark, but maybe I should postpone it till I think Professor Pepper wants to say something else. The other remark will change no, the subject. Like, yeah, on that. <laughs> if I can get this off. Well, on this question of digital, and the second least uh, worrying thing in my life next to the immortality of my soul <laughs> is whether computers are digital or whether I am one. Uh, and I'd like to say it in a very practical sense that as one works with a computer, it might appear to other people who have read an elementary description of how a computer works that it must be very frustrating to deal with this thing with all those little bits there and zeros and ones. And, but in fact, that's almost a metaphor anyway, in that the, the computer is, is bits and, and digital. And, and even apart from the fact that it's a mere metaphor, the evolution of computer science 
has been to get that as far away from your attention, from your world as possible. And, and this comes out in the, in the, in the you see it in the evolution of, of, of programming languages where not only, and this is there's a slight quarrel, a slight extension perhaps of some of the things that were said both by Putnam and Mackay about, about levels in those columns there that in fact what happens in a real computer and is that there are many, many such levels and, and the, the, there is somewhere buried in the, in the heart of that thing some electronics which I never heard of and then there's some, there's some, and it's got much too complicated for me to understand and I don't even try. There's even a machine language that I hardly even try to understand. And, and then there's some assembly language written in the machine language, and there's et cetera. It's, and even if you look at the, at, the more, at, the, at the more recent computer languages for artificial intelligence, there is no trace of seriality in them. There's the tendency is to let you write your languages as if you had free access to multiprocessing. And this has led to some of the important key ideas, some of the important uh, I think powerful ideas taken from, from, from the philosophy of science. For example, the idea of demon, that, that, that instead of saying at the precise point in a serial program where such and such a thing is to, is, is, is to be activated, you specify through some, through some set of, of rather vaguely stated conditions in terms of its function and you set it up and it sits there like the, the name is demon and the image is that you have these large number of demons asleep and under certain conditions they will jump up and, and come into, into, and, into action. And doing that sort of thing makes it vastly easier for you to talk about the program, makes the, the writing of, of programs which used to be 10 years ago maybe a, a, a year's work now become maybe a week's work and so on. So the, the, the digitality, the seriality, and so on are, are very far removed from the level at which you try to, to, to formulate the knowledge. And uh, by the way, I think that's very analogous to, to the idea of the artificiality of our intelligence and its re relation to, to biology. And in my old Piaget days, I once said it like this, that a good model of Piaget's view of of how intelligence grows is that the baby is born a biological beast. But if you really want to understand what the dynamic of the evolution of intelligence is, it's the constant struggle to get further and further away from the, the biological, from any effects of the biological substrate. Just like the programmer writing higher and higher level languages is engaged in a constant struggle to, to formulate his, his computer languages in such a way as to have the, 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 the least possible and ultimately no trace of what, the, of, of what computer it's, it's, it's written in. Now, of course, as I said, it's an open question whether this, 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 this model of, of human, of the development of intelligence as, as getting rid of the biological is, 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 is reasonable or not. And it might be that my example of the, of the roast beef is is, comes back to haunt me that it really is like that and that, that although in riding bicycles and in catching balls and in understanding language to some extent and playing chess, we write in a way that, that doesn't seem to use any, any biology, biological function. It might be true that there's some fantastically powerful computational principle built into the, 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 you know, the chemistry of the brain in some who knows what, and it seems to me highly unplausible, but we can never be absolutely sure until we've really solved all these problems that it, that it can't be the case. But anyway, the, it seems that the digital thing simply is not related to the enterprise of, of artificial intelligence, nor the serial thing, and maybe they have some echoes in the sense of, of the total amount of computation, placing a limit maybe on, on what can be done by some kind of, of computer system. And, and that was just one small way in which I disagreed with or would like to modify your statement that one would never see from the functioning of the intelligence what the, 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 the matter was. You might in some limiting sense. And I think Hans Bremermann would, would give, give you a theorem about how given the mass of your brain and the entropy and whatnot, there, there really is some actually calculable limit to the to the amount of information you could process per minute.
Yeah, that's what I, what I call second order uh, fine. Yeah. information. Well, I think you have okay. another point to make. Well, maybe. <laughs> uh, but this is not on the uh, question of artificial intelligence. I think that Professor Papert, what Professor Papert said is, is, of course, right. Is I was identifying too much the question of uh, whether we are Turing machines and the question of whether we're computers. And what you're saying is that, in a real sense, computers aren't Turing machines. Right. The um, other point I want to make is this. Um, most of what I said today, not all of it, is going to appear in an article in Cognition, by the way. Uh, that's a plug for <laughs> Cognition, which is a new psychological journal. The um, one point is this, that I think there's a sense in which what we've, all of us have been saying overlooks something very important, which is that if one is talking about actual human functioning, in a social context, then it may well be that none of these psychological states is a brain state because none of them is a state of one person. I mean, let me give you a very simple example. Uh, suppose I am jealous of someone. I'm jealous of X's regard for Y. I wish X liked me instead of Y or whatever. Um, now, I would not be in the state of being jealous of X's regard for Y if X and Y didn't exist. Might be in the state of hallucinating <laughs> that I was jealous of X's regard for Y, but it wouldn't be in the state of being jealous of X's regard for Y. In that trivial way, some of the things we call psychological states are states of systems larger than just one person. But there's an even deeper um, problem there. Suppose X and Y didn't exist. You'd say, well, you could still be jealous of X's regard for Y in, let's say, a new hyphenated sense. We bracket whether X and Y really exist. And we simply say, well, at least you are in a state we might call jealousy, although it's not now the ordinary language notion of jealousy, which certainly implies the existence of the person you're jealous of. And I say, oh, well, what would that be? And you might say, well, just being, uh, having these, if you were philosophically naive and so on, hadn't read Wittgenstein, you might say, well, you, you know, you have maybe these feelings, these surges of emotion accompanied by these visual images, that's being jealous of X's regard for Y. Now, Wittgenstein pointed out in the investigations, I think fairly conclusively, that for any story like that, you know, if you change the context, you can tell a story about someone who has those images even those surges of emotion, and has quite a different meaning. It would not be correctly described as his being jealous of X's regard for Y. And I think that Wittgenstein's point can be extended from just images. And, I mean, Wittgenstein's point is generally these mental predicates are not just about phenomenal occurrences. Although the empiricist tradition in philosophy, not the continental tradition, but the empiricist tradition has always thought they were just reducible to phenomenal occurrences. But I think they're also not reducible to brain state talk or programming talk. I think in general, that was the assumption that we have a fixed repertoire of emotions and attitudes, independent of the society we're in, seems to me just plain wrong. It seems to be quite clear that there are emotions and attitudes we have, like appreciation of an abstract theory, which were not in the repertoire of the human race at one time. And there may well be emotions and attitudes in the repertoire of an Arunha, which are not in the repertoire of any of us, that is, we've lost as well as gained. Now that means that a full-fledged psychological theory, you know, maybe have to be interdependent with social theories in a very complicated way. I mention that because I think the, one has to realize that I think when we are talking about multi-purpose heuristics of this sort that uh, Professor Papert and I have been discussing, I think we're talking within a legitimate, important idealization, but an idealization. I mean, the fact is that whatever, s we are socialized, we have socially acquired, socially evolved programs but we've only been able to program ourselves or be programmed by others 
you know, because we have an innate program that enables us to do that. There is a biologically innate program which is presupposed by the social programs. It's easy. The problem of AI and also the problem Chomsky is dealing with, the problem many people are dealing with, is the problem of saying something about the innate program, the program that a child or a chimpanzee you know, brings to these cognitive tasks. That's an important idealization, right? I mean, we can abstract from culture, say, after all, there is something which every normal human being, when small, brings to his culture, no matter whichever it is. And we can ask for a model of that. But I think the problem of separating out the innate structure of c cognition from the structure of cognition in a rich, and not to say emotion, in a rich social context, have to be separated. Well, of course, it might have been there when I was born, but there mightn't be any left now. <laughs> um, there are a number of points that I might have been tempted to follow up, but the hour is late, and I think perhaps I'll be very brief. Um, the question of um, whether wholes are greater than the sum of parts, I think, shouldn't be left uh, as if it were a matter of preference for slogans. If uh, Galileo and Aristotle had been doing their experiments in treacle instead of in free air, then indeed it would have made a difference to split the thing and uh, uh, the two smaller bodies wouldn't have fallen at the same rate as the um, large body. Uh, so that um, the question whether in a perceptual situation you have to expect qualitatively different behavior for a whole from what you would deduce by summing the responses to the parts. Uh, this is always an empirical question, and there are any number of special purpose uh, elements in the brain that do uh, respond to the whole in a different way from the sum of the individual responses to the parts. Uh, basically, the question is whether the uh, network is an additive one or whether it's multiplicative. As soon as it's multiplicative, then obviously the, uh, the whole has a different selective effect. I don't think uh, Papert would deny that. I just wanted to be sure that we didn't get the feeling that, um, as it were, the, re the way forward in AI would always be to try and reduce things to a summative model, uh, a cross-correlation model, where in, es in essence you're multiplying the effect of simultaneously present stimuli. Um, seems for most uh, pattern recognition jobs the more likely Bet. And this is one of the attractions, of course, of um, uh, hardware, that you can engineer, for instance, an artificial eye with uh, a million parallel channels and have these operating uh, in a multiplicative mode simultaneously, so that although in principle you could program this in a serial digital computer, as both speakers have pointed out, this might take an astronomically longer time to simulate. Um, I think probably in view of the time, I should just make one um, concluding point. What I think is striking about uh, our afternoon and evening is the extent to which we've found ourselves in agreement. Um, none of us has suggested that mechanistic understanding of mental processes in the sense that's been explicated uh, has any logical tendency to debunk the traditional significance attached to our uh, human mental activity, our responsibility, or if we are prepared to take it seriously, um, to debunk the concept of the immortality of the soul in the Judaic, uh, Christian, theistic form at least. Uh, I think this is significant because there's a good deal of second-rate popular journalism which gives the impression that people, on the one hand, uh, like Papert, who work in artificial intelligence, and people like myself, on the other, in brain research, are a kind of menace. You have to keep an eye on these chaps. You never know what they'll produce next, and soon we'll be nothing but machines. I think if one thing has emerged clearly, it's that none of us here regard this as a rational inference to draw from the progress of me mechanistic uh, science, either of the artificial or natural intelligence. And uh, if I may hark back to the first point Papert made, the reason why I at least 
deliberately spoke as if brain science had the links between the eye story and the brain story, and as if uh, computer scientists would be one day able to do this, that, and the other at will, was not indeed to pretend that that's a foreseeable state of the art, but just because if we're trying to get a philosophical point clear, then it's best, I think, to go to the extreme form, ask what if we reached this extreme of competence, what would then follow? And if what would then follow is innocuous to human dignity and human responsibility for human action and so on, then a fortiori, given the limits to which Papert rightly draws attention, uh, it's quite mistaken for anyone to imply or infer that progress in artificial or natural, uh, in the understanding of either artificial or natural intelligence, is in any way inimical to the values which are characteristically human, uh, either moral or religious. I must disagree with that violently. Uh, I mean, the fact that I didn't think it was worth raising doesn't mean to say that I assent. It seems to me that while you might have shown that a certain state of affairs which you describe could be consistent with continuing in your view of yourself and of your relation to man and God and the rest, it doesn't follow that that would be the case. It doesn't follow that people would necessarily subscribe to your logic, for example, and, and despite your argument that took more steps than most people usually go along with in, in important decisions of policy, you know, they might still have, people might not, might still consider that if we had machines, for example, that could do everything that people can do much better, that this might be considered as an affront to human dignity. And people might be very unhappy about the fact that, that although uh, you might be able to play being philosopher, if one really wanted to get the best argument, one would go and ask the machine. Or if one really wanted to get the best diagnosis, which is something that is even closer to, to your medical problems, you would go and ask the computer. And I do th yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think this is important, you see. What you're saying is that even though it were irrational, people might come to this conclusion. They I didn't deny that. Happy and they might change their attitudes I, I didn't, uh, I but didn't, that makes it dangerous. I didn't deny that um, people might draw irrational conclusions. What I said was <laughs> that we should recognize that such conclusions are irrational, that it does not follow from mechanistic explication or mechanistic uh, imitation of human performance, uh, that uh, the personality and its moral and spiritual significance is debunked. Uh, if Papert is saying that in spite of this fact, there are irrational people who will uh, draw false conclusions, uh, then my answer is, so what? And when he says that there might be a machine which was able to answer questions better than I, uh, I'm prepared, for the sake of argument, to suppose that there is one and that there it is inside that head. And it's the, the, the complete fallacy of imagining that this should reduce my respect for that individual just because what's inside that head is a machine, I think shows the nonsense of imagining that if people could produce such machines artificially, one would have any rational grounds for respecting the resulting person any less. But as I think we all agreed, this is science fiction when we talk about reproducing, and it was Papert who admonished me for giving as much credence to the possibility. So we're not basically disagreed on that. Uh, all I'm saying is, let us be clear that it's only by wishful thinking or wishful unthinking that anyone can make developments of art in artificial intelligence into a pretext for reducing their uh, respect for their fellow human beings. I think we want to thank the three speakers for their wonderful contributions to this meeting and to help us to clarify what would be a modern view of the immortality of the soul. 
So the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>